ki te tangi a te manawe karanga nei tui 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 ia tui ia ki runga tui ia ki raro ki, tui ia ki roto tui ia tui ia ki waho um, tui ia te hera tangata e na mana e na reo a raraka te rama te na koto te na koto te na koto katoa ko wai ao ko Richard Blake taka ingoa he kai mahi a hau te faru ana o Otago. Kia ora everyone, um, I'm Richard Blakey, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise um, and with some absences from other senior leaders I have the privilege to be Acting Vice-Chancellor today and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight to this inaugural professorial lecture for Professor Julia Horsfield. Um, um, uh, tēne te raru uh, o te maru o ka mana whenua, uh, ka te māmoi, waitaha kaitahu, I know my heart and my welcome. Um, I'm standing here under the umbrella of the people of this place, uh, Kati Māmoi Waitaha, and kaitahu to give you these greetings. Uh, ki te whare, uh, tēnā koe, uh, uh, tu tanu, tu tanu, uh, to the house that's standing here, uh, greetings and may you stand forever. But if not, uh, or there's any doubt about that, um, emergency exits are at the sides, uh, there should be exits at the rear. Uh, if we do have to evacuate, please follow instructions of staff members. Um, and a mate hairi hairi hoki atu rā ki te pō. Uh, to those that have passed, um, we think in remembrance of you. <clears throat> There's some very special greetings tonight uh, for Julie because uh, inaugural professorial lectures are celebrations and I see a number of familiar faces from the university community here, uh, Tēnā Koutou, uh, and members of the Dunedin public are uh, welcome. But in particular, uh, Julia's husband John is here and uh, online, uh, hopefully a very large audience, either in real time or through recording, but we have uh, your sons Jamie and Daniel online, uh, tēnā kaurua, uh, your parents Kate and uh, Woody and brothers Alistair and Gray, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, welcome to you all. Um, my role is just to set the scene, get things going, uh, and then I will invite, oh actually, sorry, um, uh, tēnā kaurua, uh, ko Ahoraki uh, Professors uh, Baxter and Gemmel, uh, the members of the official party, greetings to you both as well. Um, my role is to get things going and uh, outline the order of proceedings to you so you know what's going to happen. Um, I will say some general remarks about IPLs, professorial appointment at the university, then hand over to Professor Baxter to introduce the speaker to you. Julia will give her presentation, which isn't a test, although sometimes we will joke that it is, but we will uh, just uh, use this time to hear about the wonderful achievements uh, that have led to Julia's promotion. Uh, achievements, usually in research, but um, uh, the speakers will often talk about the contributions to their career development and aspects that they may be particularly proud of in their, in their teaching as well. Uh, then Professor Gemmel will give a vote of thanks and invite us all to a special place for, a, for a, an informal gathering afterwards. Now IPLs are this opportunity for us to gather as a university community and celebrate the best and the brightest, those that have achieved the apex uh, promotion uh, for academia, that to Professor. And it's a promotion that is not very easy to achieve. Uh, applicants have to demonstrate uh, significant and world-class uh, performance across all areas that are expected of academic life uh, across research, teaching and service. And in particular, leadership is, is one of the matters and, and sustained leadership is one of the matters that is taken most seriously. International referees are used to benchmark and um, Julia, in my review of her CV, I don't sit on the process, but in my review of the CV has clearly um, demonstrated over her years of uh, performance here at Otago, uh, her, her years of appointment here at Otago, those attributes. I'd like to highlight, I think as will come through Joe's presentation, significant extramural funding on both Marsden and HRC. Having four PI Marsden grants and, th and three HRCs is a very rare achievement, so congratulations. Achieving a Fulbright Fellowship uh, combining that high level research with being an effective and popular teacher and supervisor and in leadership, I, under, I know what she does, I sit on an uh, animal practice and compliance steering group that Julia contributes to and can see that she has supported others in, in, in key infrastructure such as the zebrafish facility here at Otago. So um, whilst I hand over to Professor Baxter to give a more detailed introduction, please join me in 
congratulations from the university on your most well-deserved promotion, Julia. Thank you. Enga mana, enga waka, enga reo, enga karangatanga o te motu. Tina koutou, tina koutou. Kia ora nō tātou katoa. Kei te tūau, kei te mihi ki a koutou, ki rungi te kuruai aroha ngō ngā iwi o kaitahu kā ti māmau mau waitaha hoki. Nau mai, haru mai ki tēnei hui. Ko waiau, ko tūto, ko te mauka, ko makawhi o te awa, ko kaitahu kā ti māmau mau waitaha oku iwi, ko kā ti māha ki te hapu, ko Joe Baxter tōku ingoa. Oh, well, kia ora everyone, and uh, it is a huge honour and privilege for me to have the opportunity to stand up here today and introduce uh, Professor Julia Horsfield. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jo Baxter, I'm the Dean of the Dunedin School of Medicine, and I'm very privileged to have Julia as not only one of the staff members in our school, but also the new Head of Department for Pathology. So I've very much been enjoying having the opportunity to get to know Julia better, both in her role as someone I work um, closely with, but also in particular in that role as Head of Department. Um, so Julia has a, a background earlier in biology and biochemistry and then um, arrived in the University of Otago at around 2007 and is now working in the Department of Pathology. So in preparing this um, brief overview of Julia, I uh, looked at her CV and I think Richard has highlighted how impressive that CV is and it's impossible to summarise in a few words. Um, Julia is hugely productive in research. She's diverse national and international collaborations with a range of research grants, and as Richard says, as PI and co-investigator, she has been um, led significant grants in excess of $5 million as, as PI. She supervised numerous postgraduate students and also made a significant contrib contribution to teaching with a, a particular, I, th I think, passion and contribution to postgraduate teaching and learning and also contribution to our emerging researchers. Uh, in terms of service roles, Julia has had many of those. Uh, she was once the Associate Dean Postgraduate for the Dunedin School of Medicine, has been the Director of um, Genetics Otago and has been the director since 2009 of the zebrafish facility that uh, Julia was instrumental in establishing. And as I've said, now is the head of department for pathology. And I feel quite exhausted just reading this out. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge Julia as a hugely productive and contributing staff member. So today Julia will be talking about the circle of life, understanding development from connections in biology. She'll give us some insights and her focus over the past 25 years on research that tries to understand cell proliferation dif and differentiation, and most importantly, why, by why disrupting the balance of these processes contributes to human disease. Julia and her team have been working on groundbreaking research related to cohesin, a, prote a protein that connects cell division with cell fate decisions. Julia and her team have worked on how mutations in cohesin can contribute to human developmental disorders and have also studied links between cohesin mutation and leukaemia. Uh, these are all incredible contributions, not just to science, but also the potential to make a difference for the lives of many people. And I um, now invite Professor Julia Horsfield up to deliver her inaugural professorial lecture. Kia ora. Thank you. Tēnā koutou, nō ko te rāna o kūtipuna, i tipu aki o ki porirua, ko horakirite awa awa e tō ana tōku wairua, ko te awarua o porirua, te moana, e mahe nei aku mā harahara. E mihi ana kina tōhu o nehe o ōtipote e nō honei au. 
Nō rērā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Hello everyone and thank you so much for coming along to my professorial lecture and to everyone watching online. Um, I can't believe I'm here, it's been three years and three cancellations and um, finally, finally. So um, I get to uh, try to get you all excited about what I'm excited about, which is um, developmental biology. So why am I excited about developmental biology? Who would not be excited? <laughs> A small ball of cells um, starting out um, can turn into a ma magnificent human being, such as this uh, unnamed family member that we see here, this guy. And uh, this is a truly miraculous process. And um, it relies on two different processes happening. And these are the division of cells, so cell proliferation, and then those cells have to decide what to be in the embryo, so cell fate. And um, th those are the only two things you really need to make a person. Make a lot of cells and then somehow turn them into a person, and this is pretty miraculous, really. So I guess um, it's fun to take a deep dive into what some of these processes look like. Each cell has a nucleus, and inside each nucleus, there's a whole lot of DNA packaged in there really, really tightly. So we're looking inside the nucleus of one of these cells right now and zooming outwards um, through the nuclear pore to take a view of the nucleus. Now the nucleus, every nucleus in your body has two meters of DNA stretched out, packaged inside it, which is pretty remarkable. And um, during the process of cell division, that DNA gets packaged even more tightly as we have to condense down our chromosomes to divide them in cell division. And so that process you see going on here, um, the DNA duplicates to form these homologous chromosomes which then condense and dance around the cell until they line up along the midline of the cell and pull apart into opposite poles, giving you two daughter cells. That's the process of cell division that gives you all of the cells that you need to make that beautiful human being that I showed you before. As you could see from that movie, the chromosomes have to undergo amazing morphological changes to give you um, the ability to separate them in cell division. And um, this is just a still from the movie, and I wanted to just zoom in on a chromosome and highlight that this is two sister chromatids, so, so replicated chromosomes that are held together. And they have to be held together like that so that the chromosomes can dance around the cell and then later separate um, into two daughter cells. If we didn't hold them together, then the chromosomes would just be all over the cell. So there is um, a protein complex that actually holds those two chromosomes together while this is happening. And uh, this is in fact the complex that I work on. It's called cohesin. I like to see it like this. <laughs> It is the ring of power that um, does this amazing job of holding the chromosomes together. And um, the protein complex is indeed a giant circle. So I also like to think of it as the circle of life, as well as um, the proliferation and differentiation aspect of the story. Um, so this is the main known job of cohesin. And um, if we again look back inside the nucleus and we look at the tightly packaged chromosomes, um, when the chromosomes are not dividing like we just saw, they are also packaged inside that nucleus by cohesin. So in every nucleus, this is a tightly packaged um, bundle of DNA. And if we were to make a cartoon of this, and this is kind of a textbooky cartoon, but it basically breaks down the organization of chromosomes inside the nucleus. So you can see, if I can find my notes. Yes, so you can see each chromosome squashes down into a particular region of the nucleus. And if you were to unbundle it a little bit, you would see that there are chromosome compartments that kind of are bundles that are, are then squashed up together to make the chromosome territory in the nucleus. And then each one of these bundles um, is formed by loops. And if you were to unloop the loops, you would eventually get to the DNA wound around these histone proteins. 
and then you would get to naked DNA. So the protein complex that I'm talking about, the cohesin complex, acts at the point where we form the loops. So if you can imagine this complex loaded onto DNA, if we pretend this piece of ribbon is a piece of DNA and the complex is stuck to it, how this actually works is that the cohesin is a molecular motor that extrudes the DNA through the loop, like this. So then if you can imagine you've got hundreds and thousands of cohesin complexes on your DNA, what you end up with is loops upon loops upon loops. And that is how come you can fit two meters of DNA inside a single nucleus that's only 20 microns across. So that was a deep dive into the science already. So <laughs> um, I just wanted to back out again and um, make a couple of points. So hopefully this has convinced you that DNA can use its Cohesin can use its DNA organizing properties to divide your cells, but also the properties that it uses to bundle up the DNA in the nucleus um, allows particular genes to be expressed in those cells at particular times during development. And um, what I've been working on for the last um, 20 years or so is the idea that cohesin also controls expression of genes in the nucleus, as well as does the cell division role. And um, my work way back in the early 2000s was the first to show this gene expression activity in an animal. So um, I was a baby once, here I am. And um, I was, um, as, as you heard me say earlier, my ancestors are from Scotland, and this is my mother. She's um, Scottish, and um, I was born in London, and this is me shortly after. And you can see I'm not particularly happy in this picture. I, I think it's because I haven't yet arrived in New Zealand, so, so once I'm in Aotearoa, you know, in New Zealand, I cheer up quite a bit. And, um, and so Aotearoa is where I grew up, in the Porirua region. So I went to Plimerton School, Pawatahanui School, and Aotearoa College in Porirua. And um, I did not like school very much. I wasn't bad at it, I was quite good at school, but um, eh, you know, it, I just did well, but not great or anything. And, at, but I loved to read, and so I read all of the time, and um, also wrote stories as well. And there was one particular book, which was a really, or well, series of books, which were really good fun in the early 80s, and a really good distraction, and that was the books by Douglas Adams. And I know I'm dating myself here, this is a long time ago, but I love the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy series and also Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. And um, I learned a lot from these books actually. In fact, I learned the answer to life, the universe and everything, which is apparently 42. So I don't know why we're all doing this research all the time because there's the answer right there. Um, also learned some very handy quotes, which are coming in quite handy these days, so don't panic. Um, oh no, not again. And I love deadlines. I love the whooshing noise they make as they go by. All Douglas Adams quotes. Um, in Dirk Gently, though, there is a theme, and the theme is the th fundamental interconnectedness of all things. So this apparently is a law, which I'm going to tell you about. And uh, I really believe in this law because it seems to explain a lot of um, science in that even the smallest experiments we do, every little thing that we do can meaningfully ad advance knowledge. And then seemingly insignificant pieces of knowledge can be an important, impactful part of the bigger picture. Also, Douglas Adams tells us, never mind what the answer is, we gotta figure out what the question is and ask really good questions. So something that seem, is seemingly inconsequential at the time that you're discovering it can turn out to be really important. And, and I think that says a lot about how we plan and do science. Um, can we really predict what we're gonna find? And you know, if you're writing grant applications, that's what you try to do. But um, pretty much every hypothesis that I've come up with has turned out to be Simple and wrong. <laughs> so, um, 
Inspired by my parents, uh, um, I went to university, I went to Victoria University of Wellington for my undergraduate and I was really quite inspired by my mum, pictured here standing outside our family business. So um, went in the 80s, they were growers and um, my dad designed and built the greenhouses and my mum um, grew stuff in them. And so this says, horse field quality produce, a million mites cannot be wrong. And uh, so mum was, had the greenest fingers of anybody. Um, she still has the greenest fingers of anybody. And um, so I did my first degree in botany. But I was really interested in biochemistry and I wanted to do that at the same time as botany at Victoria University. But um, in those days, apparently plants didn't have biochemistry and you could only study biochemistry if you did zoology, not botany. So um, I got around this by taking an extra year and I did a Diploma of Applied Science in Plant Physiology. Uh, the same time I finished my major in biochemistry and then I did biochemistry honours after that. And this is me standing next to a, a very sophisticated piece of equipment. It's a fra fraction collector, um, I think. So this is during um, my diploma year. And that is my actual biochemistry honours lab book. So during honours, um, I studied um, fruit flies and house flies, and I discovered that different species of fly have different quantities of DNA in them. And that I also discovered um, which I think had been known before, but I discovered um, <laughs> that not all DNA is made up of genes and some of it is in fact junk or spacer DNA. So that was quite handy to know. Um, but what if I hadn't taken that extra year to do a double degree in botany and biochemistry? Well then Professor Gemmell would have had somebody else for his lab partner in stage three biochemistry other than me and then who knows where he would be today. I mean, <laughs> So if I hadn't taken that extra year, but also if I hadn't taken that extra year, more importantly, I would never have met my husband, John, and uh, I would never have followed him to the UK because he decided he wanted to go on an OE, and so if I was interested in still staying with him, I'd better go, really. So I went to the UK, and here we are in our OE, so yeah. Oh, I needed to tell you about the bowl of petunias. I forgot about that. So, so in the Hitchhiker's Guide, um, a bowl of petunias features as a, a kind of a random object generated by the infinite and probability drive of the um, spaceship that's in there. And so wherever you see this bowl of petunias, it's a random and improbable event that has um, causation in my career, which I should have mentioned before. So I went to um, the UK with John and um, we ended up in Cambridge and um, Cambridge is a great place for science, as we know. And um, I got a job eventually at Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge. And while I was doing that job, I was, it was a research assistant job, um, I taught aerobics. And um, this turned out to be um, a handy thing to do because some of the people that came to my class worked in the LMB, which is the um, Lab of Molecular Biology. And this is where Watson and Crick stu um, studied DNA and very, very famous developmental biologists um, worked there. Famous and very grumpy as well. So Sidney Brenner was working there and um, also um, Fred Sanger was there at the time. So um, through my contacts, through my aerobics class, I got another job at the LMB and uh, there, I learnt to Sanger sequence DNA. I'd love to say this comes in really handy now, but actually <laughs> not so much. Yeah, so, so this, is, this is how we used to sequence DNA back in the day, and, and I got quite good at it while I was at the LMB. Um, yeah, so, but it wasn't this DNA sequencing bit that got me excited though. As I mentioned, some very famous developmental biologists worked at the LMB at the time, and um, I learnt while I was there that there are special genes um, in animals that actually determine the body pattern of those animals. Where to put your head, your, your six legs, and, and your wings, and your tail. Um, they have particular genes that specify those things. And those genes are activated by particular signalling pathways that tell cells what to be. And I just thought this was just the most amazing thing. And so the people who were working on this were working on mutants from 
fly mutants from a screen that had been conducted um, to determine these body patterning plans. And um, so they were all really excited um, about studying how this worked. And so I thought, yeah, this is what I want to do. I'm sold. I'm going to, I'm going to be a developmental biologist. So um, I couldn't stay in Cambridge. So eventually we ran out of money and went back to New Zealand after seeing a lot of Europe. And I started a PhD at Otago eventually after um, working at Victoria University and the Maligan Institute for a bit. And I chose Otago because friends were coming here and I chose my supervisor randomly, and I'm not kidding. So I thought, well, I'll go to the biochemistry department. They're sure to have developmental biology and nothing in there looked like it. So I just pretty much picked a guy, which was Warren Tate, and I wrote to him and said, dear Professor Tate, um, I'd like to do a PhD in developmental biology. Do you do developmental biology? And he's like, sure. So, <laughs> so, um, so I went and did something that wasn't quite developmental biology, but it was amazing. So, so here's um, Warren and me and my dad and John um, back when I'd just gotten my PhD. So what did I get out of it? I got amazing mentorship from Warren and uh, he, was, he was just so great a supervisor. And I made some lifelong friends as well at Otago, some of whom are still around today. And at the same time, my father was doing his own experiment with fish in the um, Lake Oho Canal. So he was the first guy ever to put a salmon raft in the canals of the Mackenzie country. And this is the very first one going in, in the top, um, right there. And so um, if you go along and, and help out, you get some pretty good cold resilience. And I got some good fish feeding experience as well out of that experiment of my dad's. So eventually there was a publication out of my PhD and it was all about ribosomal frame shifting and protein synthesis and that sort of thing. And uh, I got right into it. And the thing that fired me up the most was the mechanism of the thing that I was looking at. How was it working? I learned to get really curious about how things actually work in biology. What is cause and effect? Um, and I also learned that our RNA and protein are apparently just as important as DNA, who knew? So it was really handy to know that as well. Um, yeah, and so caution though, because Douglas Adams quotes um, that the complexities of cause and effect defy analysis. So I was warned and it is still pretty tricky to work this out to this day. So there was a lot of focus on hard work in the lab and um, I got my PhD in about three years and three months, which was pretty quick, but we had a lot of fun at the same time in the lab. And so here's one of the um, fancy dress parties back in the day. There's some familiar fa faces to some people up there maybe, but um, yes, it was very good fun. But my first true love was developmental biology. And um, so I quickly began to look around for postdoc positions that um, could offer me that training. I didn't have to look too far because it was a very good lab in Adelaide, Australia. And I went to work with a guy called Rob Saint and, and um, also Helena Richardson, who was just starting up in his lab. And um, this is Julie, Helena's PhD student. So while we were in Adelaide, um, we also got into the, the kind of the life of around um, Adelaide. So there's uh, a lot of win wineries. There's three different wineries surrounding, wine districts surrounding Adelaide. Um, I got into um, triathlon and road cycling. And so I had to put in this picture because this is the absolute highlight of my cycling career. So that's me, um, red arrowed there. I'm riding in a warm-up race to the tour, tour Down Under, and for those of you who know, that's the, the biggest um, south, um, Southern Hemisphere cycling race. And this was maybe the second year they'd run it. One, and and um, yeah, I actually won the race, um, the women's race, so hey, thank you. <laughs> The guy who won the men's race got like a few thousand dollars. I got a bottle of whiskey. So I still have the bottle. So. Yeah. Okay, so um, what, else did, what else happened? So um, I was working in a, in a Drosophila lab and this was a lab that worked on the cell cycle. So um, what they were really interested in in the lab is um, figuring out how the cell cycle and developmental signals interact with each other. 
So um, Drosophila have, which are these fruit fly things, have these amazing um, structured eyes. And here's one under an electron microscope. This is a normal eye. And it's got this beautiful grid of these um, clones of cells called omatidia. If there aren't enough of these cells, the fly can't make a proper eye, and you get this rough-looking eye over here in this particular cell cycle mutant for um, this protein called cyclin E, which you need to get through the cell cycle. So um, in this lab, what I was looking for is that anything could modify this rough eye might be something that talks to the cell cycle to tell a cell what to be or to keep proliferating. So. Um, I did a genetic screen in the lab to try and find these modifiers um, as part of a screen team, but I also tested some signaling pathways and how they interacted with this eye. And uh, I found one particular signaling pathway. Um, so this looks really weird. This is, this is decapentaplegic, and the, um, the human or animal homologue will be the bone morphogenetic signaling pathway, which goes to de develop a lot of um, your own tissues. And um, basically what this shows is that a cell signaling pathway that tells cells what to be can actually interact with the cell cycle and tell cells to stop cycling so that they can then decide what to be. So I learnt a lot in this lab. So I learnt about um, cell division and the cell cycle, and I learnt about the signaling pathways that can then feed in to, to tell cells what to be. And I learnt about genetic screens. Um, so genetic screens being a way to find new genes that do interesting things in animals. So um, at the same time that I was doing this, um, cohesins were found. So cohesins were the proteins that um, hold the sister chromatids together. They had to be found sometime. They were actually found a year before I published my paper in Adelaide by this guy called Kim Naismith. And, uh, I went to a conference and Kim Naismith was talking about how they were responsible for cell division. So that was sort of a coincidence. So after Adelaide, um, I went back to New Zealand and took up a postdoctoral fellowship with Phil and Kathy Crozier at the University of Auckland. And they hired me because I'd done Drosophila forward genetics, so genetic screens in Drosophila so that I could then do pretty much the same in zebrafish. So use zebrafish to find new mutations that would affect um, particular developmental pathways. So why would you use zebrafish for anything at all? So the reason is because um, we'd love to know how this ball of cells turns into a, a, a nice human being, but we can't normally see it because um, mammalian embryos develop inside the uterus. And so fish offer this opportunity to um, watch external development of an embryo. And they're really handy things to have because a pair of fish can lay hundreds of eggs. And um, so you've got lots of little subjects to look at down a microscope. And um, you can keep them cheaply and easily, way cheaper than mice. And <laughs> yeah. And, um, and they're very, very um, amenable and robust. So here's two fish of breeding, and they give you this beautiful caviar, which you can see here, and there's a single cell here on top of a yolk. Caviar is pretty special because it can grow, and uh, so this is a zebrafish embryo that's going through its first 24 hours of development, and you can see the Recognisable structures starting to emerge here. Here's the eye, the muscles, and the tail. Um, the centre bit is the yolk. So, so it's um, very, very easy just to look down a microscope and see what's happening. And you've got a really nice um, model to, to look at how you get an animal out of a single cell. So zebrafish were just really starting up in, in the um, 90s and in the late 90s when I joined this lab um, it was pretty much in their infancy um, and so I got to be part of that um, movement of using zebrafish as a model as well. So while I was at University of Auckland um, we started a family and so um, it was balancing this research with these small children was quite exciting as well and uh, it was a fun time. So at the same time that, uh, that I was doing this though, um, cohesins were being worked on elsewhere. So the first, whoops, the first cause of a 
gene expression biocohesin was found in a fruit fly by this guy called Dale Dorset. Don't worry about the title, it's very complicated, but, um, but people were starting to realize that this cell division protein had jobs in other ways as well as just in cell division. Um, but I was hired to um, progress a leukemia project, and uh, leukemia is caused by many different gene mutations, but one of them that's well known is the RUNX1 or AML1 gene. And if you rearrange chromosomes so that you get a break in the RUNX1 gene, um, this can cause acute myeloid leukemia. Also, if you just get point mutations in the RUNX1 gene, this is common in blood cancers. And so my project was to find second mutations that affected RUNX1 expression, because these might also be causative of leukemia. So we use zebrafish for this, and um, here you see zebrafish embryos over here, very early in development. And the blue cells that you can see here are cells that have switched on the RUNX1 gene. And the cells that are in that lateral stripe there are the same cell type as those that give rise to very earliest blood in mouse and human embryos. So um, out of this genetic screen where I created de novo mutations in fish and then looked for an effect on RUNX1, I found this one mutation that still had, um, so that still had the neuron expression which is um, the dots that you can see across the back of the embryo, but did not have these lateral stripes of expression which give rise to blood. So um, I called this the 17.1 mutation because this was the 17th batch of fish I'd screened and it was fish number one. So that's why. And when I was looking into what this mutation caused, I noticed that it also had a problem with the cell cycle. So um, this is staining of cells that are trying to go through the cell cycle, but what's happened is that they've um, stopped part way through. And instead of the chromosomes separating, you can see in this cell down the bottom that some have gone this way, some have gone that way, and some are stuck in the middle. And these ones over here have got chromosomes all over the cell. And um, I thought, oh, I think there might be a problem with mitosis in, the, in this fish. And, um, I wouldn't have probably known that if I hadn't already worked on the cell cycle in Drosophila in my previous project. And so then after sort of having that hint, I embarked on a, on a, on a kind of soul-destroying journey of trying to find out what the gene was. And uh, it took about, it took more than two years. So once you have a mutation in a forward genetics experiment, you need to be able to figure out what you mutated to cause the phenotype. So the only way you could do this in fish was to um, do meiotic mapping, and, and uh, that involves running lots and lots of PCRs on a gel. And I ran well over 200 of these gels in two years to try and find the interval which my gene was in. When I did, I figured out what it was pretty much straight away because um, I picked the gene that was involved in the cell cycle. So in the meantime, the first link of cohesin to human disease was found in labs in the USA. So this looks like a different gene, but actually there's my gene, which is a member of the cohesin complex, and their gene is um, a protein that actually loads the cohesin molecule onto DNA. So, um, so then um, after five years, and I'm not kidding, of no papers, I published my research. And um, this was the first instance of cohesin regulation of a gene in a vertebrate, the first linkage of cohesin with leukemia, and the first kind of um, knowledge that cohesin can have tissue-specific causes of gene regulation. And this was extremely hard to publish because people are like, well, this is a cell cycle protein. Why is it, how do you explain this gene regulation thing? So it was rejected by probably three or four journals before getting into the development journal. When it did though, this guy, Dale Dorset, who was the first guy to find gene expression in a fly, immediately emailed us and said, really? 
Wow, and uh, so one person was a fan. Anyway, so, <laughs> so he emailed our lab and, and my boss kind of said, oh, well, why don't you talk to him? So I did, and he invited me to the Cornelia DeLong Foundation meeting in the USA, where there's um, all these um, patients that have Cornelia DeLong syndrome with the cohesive mutations underlying them. And then at that meeting, I met a guy called Antonio Musio, who was kind of a European counterpart and he invited me to a meeting in Italy where I met Kim Naismith and heard him talk again about cohesins and, and so it was sort of full circle around to what I'd been working on in my postdoc in Adelaide. So, so now we have a better idea about what our complex looks like. So it consists of all these different subunits and we have a better idea of how it works to regulate gene expression. So, just to show you, I have another piece of ribbon. This time I've got some different colors in the ribbon. So think of the red DNA as junk DNA, right? And this blue piece of ribbon is a gene. And then this yellow piece of ribbon here, that's a regulator of a gene, okay? So if you would load your cohesin onto your DNA, and as I was describing to you before, it does this thing called loop extrusion. So it pulls the DNA through the ring. So now you've got a, a way of bringing your regulatory element into contact with your gene. So if you extrude the DNA through, now these two that were linearly separated are in the same place in space. And this is something that is controlled by the cohesin complex. So the other thing that can happen is that other proteins come in and combine these things together. And so um, if you didn't have the cohesin complex there, you would get more of these other proteins. And then that would increase, or in some cases, decrease expression of that gene. And the other thing you can do with your regulator is um, take it completely out of the picture. So put it in a loop that is now over here, so it can't regulate that gene. So this one molecule, just by arranging the DNA in the nucleus, bringing in gene regulators into close contact with genes, can actually activate or repress them. And if you don't have it, the consequences are Either you lose expression or you can gain expression from those genes. So now in the lab, we study this process in cancer cells and in zebrafish. And, um, but to, to get to the lab, we had to move down to the University of Otago. And I, I'm thankful every day for having my job at the university. Um, it's amazing working in this place and it's been a, an amazing um, 16 years, I think, that I've been here. But um, I worked in zebrafish and I had my mutant and I wanted to start my lab, so I was wondering if they had something like this, like a, an aquarium that I could use for my zebrafish. And uh, it turned out that there wasn't. And um, I had to go to the local fish breeder and um, get a couple of tanks and um, put them, just put them in a lab, basically. So that's the first Otago zebrafish facility right there. So um, eventually we got some tanks um, that do the job better. Um, oddly enough, these are smaller tanks. Um, so these are just three litre tanks, but there's rather a lot of them. So, um, so now we have a whole library of fish that we can use for different experiments. And so um, I won't, have time to cover our journey um, since then, but um, essentially what we do in the lab is um, try and understand the basis of these human conditions that are caused by cohesin mutations known as the cohesinopathies. And uh, like I said, you can get increases or decreases in gene expression and many different um, outcomes in human disease. So changes in the face, changes in the skeletal structure, and um, and trying to sort of distinguish between two different types of conditions, Cornelia de Long syndrome and Roberts syndrome is something that the lab has worked on too. So if we were to um, use an example, here's a pretty good one where we've slightly depleted a cohesin subunit and you can see quite a dramatic change in heart function in 
um, cohesin deficient versus normal zebrafish. So there you see the, the heart is labelled in, in sort of blue and the blood is red fluorescent. And so using the power of this model, we can actually determine what goes wrong in development when we just deplete this subunit. And then in cancer, um, so after I'd made that original discovery with RUNCS1, um, 10 years later they started sequencing all these human cancers. And these genome sequencing projects well, suddenly revealed that there were a whole lot of cohesin mutations in many different types of cancer, and in particular, leukemia. So, go figure. And so now we um, work on finding drugs that kill cohesin muted cancer cells. And so, um, if you put drugs on um, cells that have cohesin mutations, it turns out that those cells are more sensitive. And so some of this work was um, published fairly recently when we found that a signaling pathway that determines cell fate interacts with the cell cycle. And if you overhype that signaling pathway, then you interfere with um, the cells that have the cohesin mutation that controls cell proliferation. So, so again, um, things just keep popping up that are themes from stuff that I've studied in the past. And so all of this research that has been built on in my lab all started from this one genetic screen in 19, started in 1999, which is when I started in Auckland. We didn't know what we were going to find. You don't in these genetic screens. You just um, generate something and then you follow it and you follow it until you can figure out how it works and what it does. So in conclusions, I, I sort of want to reiterate that everything that we do can meaningfully advance knowledge, whether we know that we are what we're going to find or not and that this takes time so it, it's taken 20 years with this mutant to, to even figure out what how it's contributing to um, development and cancer and um, at the time it was nobody understood it and I, I think we're a little bit closer but it's maybe still far I don't know and then seemingly insignificant knowledge can be an important impactful part of the bigger picture. Well, I contend that humans are really bad at predicting impact in advance. Um, if we knew what we were going to find, why would you do the experiment? So, um, so I think then it's even more important to ask really good questions and to never stop asking them. Last week, this was published. So the COVID virus can restructure human architecture. So um, your DNA and your nucleus can get rewired by a COVID infection. And it turns out that COVID virus disrupts loop extrusion mediated by cohesin. And that gives you the expression of genes that are responsible for the inflammation that you get in long COVID. So when everyone comes up to me and says, why do you work on this stupid molecule all your life? Well, it does everything, doesn't it? So there you go. So there are many important people to thank. And um, I just want to start with, um, in the black uh, type there, all the people who advised me through my career. So starting from botany um, back at Victoria University and um, all the way through to um, my studies in Auckland. And then in blue, there's every um, one I could remember who's uh, I've worked with <laughs> in the lab over all of the years. And, and thanks so much to everyone for being part of this journey. Um, it's just been amazing. And then um, all the different collaborators, uh, local collaborators that have um, <laughs> taken part in grants and, and kind of also um, just been around to have a beer with. And there are people um, not on the slide that are um, also amazing to have a beer with, but the font would have been that small. And, and then I can't stress enough how important international collaboration has been to this study. So an international researcher recognised the importance of my discovery way back um, when I was just a, a postdoc not knowing what I got. And it was that contact that that person made with us that oops, made everything um, kind of blossom. And so I think it's really important that we still remain an internationally connected university with our international collaborations. Oh, and this here, uh, this guy, um, down the bottom right, come on mouse. This guy, that's Eric Vieschhaus. He has a Nobel Prize for um, 
being the guy who generated the first um, Drosophila screens that generated the mutants that they were studying in Cambridge that got me excited in the first place, place about developmental biology. Him and Christian Nusslein Volhart. So um, there's been cycling over the years as well, and um, I've had a lot of fun with my cycling buddies. It's kept me sane, and uh, when you're pedaling really hard, you can't think about anything else, so that's really quite good sometimes. Um, some of my friends don't do a lot of cycling, um, but I've managed to persuade them to. That's my best friend, Melanie Kohler from Wellington. And some of my friends I have to try and keep up with down the drop-offs and, and uh, <laughs> single track. The um, grade three that's really a grade four that I've been persuaded down many a time. And um, some people, I've, I don't do any more triathlons, but here's one that I did with some people from the um, Department of Biochemistry as a cyclist, and then um, having a lot of fun on the mountain bike as well with the beautiful Dunedin scenery. So um, getting to the end, I promise. So, so um, next I'd like to thank my lovely boys, Jamie and Daniel. So early on, it looked promising that they would become scientists. Um, I could see them studying hard there, but as it turned out, um, not so much. So they, they really are art students at Victoria now, and uh, so proud of you guys, and it's been amazing of you to put up with me all this time. Um, I'd love to thank my um, beautiful Fano, particularly um, my mum, Kate, and my dad, Woody, and all of my family who are always there in the tough times and the good times, and uh, it's been an amazing journey. Um, and it's been great having your support. And last but not least, my lovely husband, who um, does some of the work, <laughs> um, keeps me sane all these years and, and has always supported me in every single way. And, and thank you. I can't thank you enough for all that you've done. So I just want to leave you with a quote. Let's think the unthinkable, let's do the undoable. Let us prepare to grapple with the ineffable itself and see if we may not eff it after all. <laughs> Douglas Adams, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. Uh, so I'm Neil Gemmell, I'm the Acting Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences. It doesn't ever roll off the tongue easily, that one. Uh, and um, it's interesting that you raise Douglas Adams and, uh, and the power of serendipity because um, it's, it's kind of curious how I am here giving the thanks to uh, such a wonderful lecture. Um, and Julia and my connection go back uh, some, some, some decades. Uh, so um, it's actually quite a privilege to be able to do this. So the, the sort of fundamental uh, interconnectedness of all things uh, obviously led us to this place. And uh, no, under normal circumstances, this vote of thanks would be given by a head of department. Uh, and that last head of department before Julia in pathology was Alison Rich, who recently retired from the university, so Alison couldn't do it. Um, Warren Tate, who was Julia's uh, PhD mentor, may have been able to um, give a great summation. In fact, I know he would have. And I hope he's um, watching, uh, uh, but he wasn't available. And so you drew the short straw and you got me. Um, but it is one of those serendipitous moments that, um, that, that, that leads to this event. And actually I'm struggling with my Douglas Adams here, but uh, I, am, I, I recall in that book that Arthur Dent, who is the man at the center of the story, ends up uh, um, on a spaceship uh, where he meets a girl called Trillian, who he had met at a party in London, uh, and she'd been whisked away by a two-headed alien. Who knew? Um, uh, and when I came to the University of Otago 15 years ago, I had a sort of a Trillian moment because there was Julia, and we'd known each other for, seemed like for forever, but we'd lost touch. Um, and it was just delightful to be able to reconnect and learn about uh, the successes that she had achieved at that time, and then obviously to work with her over the last 15 years. Um, so just to reflect, what Julia has delivered is a, a, 
uh, actually a really good um, a su pot summary of um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So there were quite a few spoilers there, to be fair. And you won't need to read the uh, trilogy, which is in four parts now. Uh, but the she's told us uh, about the power of of, of being inquisitive, of asking questions, of tucking away pieces of knowledge that seem uh, seemingly uh, irrelevant at the time, and then uh, learning how those connections become enlightened by new information as we go forward. And I think that's incredibly powerful. Um, it's incredibly powerful. And it's something that we need to be mindful of um, as we go through our scientific uh, journeys because the piece of information that we gain on a day-to-day -day basis may in fact be the um, seeds of, of, of quite brilliant discoveries later. Um, Julia has done, as I expected she would, uh, given us a tour de force on why cohesions are the most important thing and everyone should be studying them. Um, but she's told us how this central molecule uh, controls such a uh, essential part of um, our growth and development and how we go from those uh, single cells to uh, the quite unique beings we are. One of the things I find uh, quite, quite terrifying as a geneticist and also somebody that does um, studies reproductive biology is, is how many ways that can go fundamentally wrong. And it's quite terrifying. And yet, and this is I think the exquisite precision of it all, most of the time, in many instances, it goes exqui exquisitely right. And how that happens is actually one of life's great mysteries. We haven't still quite answered that yet. But, you know, there's still time, Julia, you know. Um, uh, I... Right, yes. So I think I've covered most of the points I wanted to cover. But just to say thank you very much for sharing um, your, your, your journey through science, uh, your journey through discovery, um, for, for plugging the need to undertake basic research, for plugging the zebrafish facility, um, for plugging the need to stay internationally connected. Uh, so I, those subtle messages that you've uh, percolated through your talk, I'm sure were um, very carefully and uh, thought and very articulately delivered, and we've taken them on board. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, I will now segue to my second job, which is actually my normal formal role as Acting Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor of Health Sciences, which is to thank you all for attending. Um, you know, it's, these are wonderful and special events, um, and I think we've had a real treat tonight. So, again, thank you, Julia, and thank you all for being part of this uh, very special day. It doesn't end here. Uh, it, um, we now have the opportunity uh, um, to go across to the staff club and have a bit of kai, a bit of, uh, a bit, a bit of, a bit of drink. Um, I don't know if the staff club manages to do pangalactic gargle blasters, but I'm willing to give it a try. Uh, and if I recall correctly, that is like having your um, brain smashed with a gold brick with a small slice of lemon wrapped around it or something like that. Um, anyway, on that note, I just want to thank everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful um, opportunity to uh, hear about Julia's research. And before I forget, and I almost did, um, I just want to give you, Julia, this small gift and token of appreciation from the University of Otago for delivering such a fine oration. Passive.